Abraham Lincoln was one of, if not the greatest president that we've had. Now, I know that that's in some ways a controversial statement for some because there are some who believe that he should uh, have let states do what they want, but he was trying to preserve the union and life in America would look very different if we had two or three states instead of one. Um, why he is great is that is what he endured through his presidency. And preserving the union, which was his goal, was not an easy task. Many men before him, Buchanan and Tyler and Polk and others had failed at this question of slavery. And by the time it came to Lincoln, he inherited a real mess. And rather than blaming others, took it and did better than most men would. I think we've seen many presidents since who would not have had the strength of character and integrity and uh, courage to do what Lincoln did. Few others have had to endure the stress of keeping our country together. And anymore, it seems like our presidential candidates aren't even really trying that hard. But at the time, for Lincoln, it was a very hard task to try to keep the country together. Now, Abraham Lincoln was probably not born again, but uh, at least at the beginning. But as his presidency went on, he progressively looked to God for help in the conflict and for guidance. Part of getting into the Bible and part of being a part of a church is getting help for the inevitable trials. We can't help that we're living in a world where we're going to suffer and where we're going to have trouble. That trouble isn't always because of individual sin, but it's all because of the sin curse. And so it's inevitable that Christians would struggle against um, trials. And Christians are just as susceptible to stress and to mental anguish and to despair as anybody else. But we have greater tools because we have a great Savior. And that's the important thing to remember, that why we come to church, why we read the Bible, why we develop and cultivate a relationship with Christ isn't just because that's the, what we're meant to do, that's because it's obedience to Christ, but it also is just a real benefit. It's a help to plug into the person of God because as we do, he fixes us, he helps us, he straightens us out. I wonder at times if I went in to see a therapist or a psychologist, just what kind of things that person would say about me and uh, the things that I struggle with. I, I don't know about you, but I, I feel like sometimes I get so far into my own head that I wonder if anybody else thinks the way that I do. Am I the only crazy person? I suspect that's not true, but... Um, in my, in my thinking through my own trials, mentally and otherwise, I've realized how much I need that relationship with God. It, it isn't really a matter of obedience for me. It's a matter of need. Jesse Ventura, the governor of Minnesota, once said that religion was a crutch. And I will say to that, amen. amen. Yep. Yep. You just don't know that you need one, Jesse. <laughs> Um, now, it's true, statistically, that people that go to church, people that believe in God, tend to fare better with mental health. That's not a, true across the, it's not true maybe specifically or individually, but across the board, it seems like uh, even secular psychologists and therapists have said that people that go to church and people that believe in God and uh, develop their spirit um, deal with stress better. There's something called the Holmes and Rahe scale, and it's one to a hundred. And a hundred is like the, the the most stressful thing that you can you can have. And then it kind of goes down from there. And uh, what they use with this Holmes Rahe scale is is how many of these things. Uh, traumatic things that you've experienced in, say, the last five years, and if it's above this certain number cumulatively, then you're, you're probably in a lot of trouble, and you're probably dealing with a lot more stress. It's one thing if this happens a little bit at a time. Um, but that scale, again, tends to be lower for people that are walking with the Lord. That's not, it's not a cure-all. 
I'm just, I want to talk about that this morning. I want to talk about when the trials of life come and you are hit with the news, the circumstances, the, the things that you're thinking even in your head. Where do you go? And I, I mentioned therapists and psychologists, and I don't know that there's not a place for that. But as Christians, can we find a better remedy than antidepressant drugs, than drowning out our sorrows, than entertaining ourselves to forget the things that we're dealing with? We, do we have better tools available to us? The answer, of course, is yes. The question I'm asking is, will you avail yourself of them? In Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul says, be careful, which means full of care or anxious or worried for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Can I be real honest? I could preach an entire series of messages on those two verses. It's so, so good. But I want to focus on this idea that Christ can keep your heart and mind. If you will go to him, if you'll plug into him, he will keep your heart and mind. And I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know the stresses that you have in your life right now. But I want to encourage you this morning in our passage that God can meet you where they are and help you with those things. We're looking at the life of David and the many trials that he endured. He is not king yet, um, but he is on the run. And he knows that one day he will be king. Last week, you remember that... David was so worried that Saul was going to kill him that he went into the land of the Philistines and he decided that he was going to work for Achish, the king of Gath. Gath is the place that Goliath was. Uh, he was working for the enemies of Israel and there he was. And then this week, we're going to look at this culmination. So since chapter 21, and I couldn't even tell you when I preached out of 1 Samuel 21, but um, it's been that long, and now here we are. Everything is coming to a head. The, if this were a, uh, a two-part movie, this would be the end of the first movie, the climax and the cliffhanger going into the second part of the movie in 2 Samuel. And what I want to look at is one verse, and then I want to look that's where we are with David. I'm going to look behind, and I want to look in front. And that one verse is verse 6. 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself and the Lord his God. Now, you say, well, I don't know a lot of context for this verse. Well, we'll get you there. Uh, but I wanted to at least land there and say that's what we're looking at. David has loss, and people want to stone him, and he encourages himself in the Lord. So let's first of all talk about the need for encouragement. Notice it says that David was greatly distressed. The word di greatly distressed means wholly pressed in. It was like everything, the word distressed means pressed or he was in a narrow spot. He felt like he was hemmed in. Um, any soldier um, wants to find a place where they can, uh, if they have the defensive position, narrow the scope of where the enemy can come in. But when you're running for your life, you don't want fewer options. You want lots of options. And David now has no options. He is so greatly distressed. He is so wholly pressed in. He's so squeezed that he doesn't know what to do. And it's true, doesn't it? That, that, that is such a good picture of the way that life feels when we're going through trials. That it, it, we sometimes talk about it feels like a burden on my shoulders. In fact, if you get stress, you actually feel it in your shoulders. But it's like it's coming not just from above, but from everywhere. You feel like you're pressed in um, from every direction. And it's one thing if you have those one at a time. If it's just one thing at a time, you can deal with one thing a year. But then all of a sudden, it's not one thing, it's seven. And all of a sudden now, you feel like, I can't take this. And you say to yourself, I thought God said he'll never give me anything that I can't handle. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. But it, we often feel like that is a truism. Why, God, would you give me more than I can bear? Then they pile up and it can be harder. And whether it's financial trouble, a health crisis, even national troubles, family problems, whatever it is, 
um, we can really feel that pressure. I think I've told this before, but I'll say it just for those of you who maybe didn't, uh, hasn't, haven't heard it, but in 2001, um, I felt this, this pressing in. 2001, of course, September, there was national calamity, September 11th, and for those of you who aren't alive, um, it's hard to really imagine. See, now we're however many years, 23 years past it, almost, but at the time, we had no idea what this meant for America. We had no idea what it was going to mean for our future. Here I am at college, uh, just started, I think Amy and I had been dating one year and a day on September 11th, and uh, we didn't know what the future was going to look like, you know? And all of a sudden, there's this, there was pressure. Everybody's stressed out. Everybody's wondering, nobody's happy. Everyone's wondering, what does this look like? And then, um, on, and then I had a friend who, um, and this is a Bible college, but a friend of mine actually took his own life there on campus. And I felt that was the first time I'd ever had a personal friend die in that way. And I felt like things were getting a little closer. It was my world, my college campus. And then in October of that same year, I found out that my mom had stage four ovarian cancer. And all of a sudden now the future is really unknown. And my mom, who I loved and had a great relationship with, was on death's door as it seemed. And it felt like that circle was getting closer. And I remember even thinking of that, like, wow, that's weird. You know, that national, and then in my own world, and then now my own family, um, I guess I'm next. And sure enough, that January, I had asked Amy to marry me, but just a few days before, we were on her dad's farm, and I got some parasite on the farm and got really, really sick. Lost 15 to 20 pounds and uh, just couldn't just couldn't function. I had my mom uh, was a nurse. She took me into the hospital so I could get IVs because I was so dehydrated, just so I could propose to her. To I had so I'd have the strength to propose to Amy. Right? That's how sick I was. Terry, do you remember me just like being sick up here? And I was like, I, I think I asked. I think I asked Terry, "Can I marry your daughter?" I was like, "Listen, can I?" And she's like, "Yes, yes, fine. We all know what's going on here." Um, but I was sick, and uh, all of that was probably the most pressed in I've ever been. I've dealt with trials since, and listen, I get it. You're listening to me and you're like, oh, those sound really cute. Let me tell you what I'm dealing with right now, right? And I get it. I'm not saying mine is worse than yours, I'm just saying that's my story. I know what it's like in my own way to be pressed in, and yours is different. Maybe it's 20 years in the past, 30, 40 years in the past, Maybe it hasn't happened yet, and this message is going to be for that moment. But David was greatly distressed. Now, what was David facing? Five different things he was facing in this moment where he was distressed. First of all, his nation, Israel, was under attack. Go back to chapter 28, if you would. We're in 30. Go back to chapter 28. Verse number one says it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what uh, thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. So um, he's excited about this. Verse number four, the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. So they started off in one area, and the Philistines are just getting closer and closer and closer, and the battle is going to be um, uh, when the two armies meet. But the Philistines are coming. Israel is in danger. And uh, look, go ahead and look in chapter 29. They're getting closer and closer. Chapter 29, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek, which means fortress, and the Israelites pitched by a fountain, which is in Jezreel, and the lords of the Philistines passed by hundreds and by thousands, but David and his men passed on in their rear reward with Achish. Skip down to verse 11. So David and his men rose early to depart in the morning to return into the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. So Jezreel is where the fight's going to be. The Israelites are there by the fountain, and now the Philistines are there, and now the fight is going to happen. And David can't help. He's banned from Israel. If he shows up, Saul will kill him, and Saul is out to get him. He can't do anything, but he knows that his people are, are in trouble, and that is a very distressing thing for him. National troubles can bring fear about the future. 
It can, be, it can bring stress to those around us. It, everything feels very much out of our control. And again, one of these days, you'll talk to your kids, grandkids, about what COVID was like. You know, Now, four years out, we're like, yeah, it wasn't that big of a deal. I feel bad for everyone who died. Um, and I feel like you know, America, in a way, got a, a lesser strain than other places in the world. But you know, looking back, we, we know now, OK, fine. But at the time, when you saw video footage of you know, uh, refrigeration trucks full of bodies in Italy, we're like, oh, no, what does this mean for us? So uh, national troubles aren't worth nothing. Now, it's true, isn't it, that some of us focus a little too much on what's going na on nationally? There's this weird balance where we don't want to be ignorant of what's going on, but we don't want to be troubled by it all the time. And I meet too many people that should probably turn their TVs off and not watch as much about what's going on in the world, especially when we can't affect very much at all. When I got to meet with legislators, um, uh, some of them in May when we went to Washington DC, I just realized how powerless somebody like me is. I mean, it's, I have, have no voice at all. And that can either be frustrating for me, or you can say, that's the way it works. I'm going to go back to Park Rapids and work in my own little corner of the world and make a difference for the people that I can. But national troubles do bring stress. Two, he had been fired from his job. Back in chapter 28, you say, what? Back in chapter 28, verse 1 uh, and 2, we said that Akish says, I want you to come with me, right? And, and it's interesting, uh, Akish says, hey, we're going to fight Israel, and you're coming with me. Well, here's the consequence of David's actions. He went to work for the Philistines, and surprise, the Philistines want to go fight Israel. Now, I love David's cryptic response in verse number two. Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And maybe if it's a movie, he turns to the camera and kind of winks, right? <laughs> because maybe he's got a plan that he's going to, you know, halfway through the battle, surprise, we're actually fighting for Israel against the Philistines. We'll never know because over in chapter 29, as David and the Philistines are arranging themselves to go and invade Israel, some of the princes of the Philistines noticed that David was there. And in verse 3, it says, the princess of the Philistines what, said, um, what do these Hebrews hear? What, what, what? We're going to battle with Israel. Why are there Israelites here? Why are there Hebrews here? And Achish said unto the princes of the Philistines, is not this David, the servant of the Saul, the king of Israel, which hath been with me these days or these years? And I found no fault in him since he fell into me to this day, 14 months. David's been working for Achish. And uh, Achish says, man, this guy's been great. Yeah, I think, I think he's totally, totally done. In fact, at the end of chapter 27, Achish is like, huh, so David has totally made himself uh, an enemy of Israel? He's, he's good. Let's take him with us. But the princes of the Philistines are not convinced. Verse 4, the princes of the Philistines were wroth with him. And the princes of the Philistines said unto him, Make this fellow return, that he may go again to his place which thou hast appointed him. And let him not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he be an adversary to us. For wherewith should he reconcile himself unto his master? Should it not be with the heads of these men? Is not this David of whom they sang one to another in dances, saying Saul slew his thousands and David his ten thousands? Ah, there comes the song again, right? The old song that got him in trouble twice now. Here's the third time. They're like, wasn't there a top hundred hit that talked about how many Philistines David killed? Yeah, but that was like 14 months ago. Well, not soon enough. Not enough time has passed. Verse 6, Achish called David and said unto him, Surely as the Lord liveth. Now that's cool. I like that. Achish is invoking the Lord. Um, as the Lord liveth, thou hast been upright, and thy going out and thy coming in with me in the host is good in my sight. For I have not found evil in thee since the day of thy coming unto me unto this day. Nevertheless... The Lord's favor thee not. My hands are tied. Wherefore, now return and go in peace that thou displease not the lords of the Philistines. And David said unto Achish, But what have I done? And what hast thou found in thy servant so long as I have been with thee unto this day, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Again, another wink. <laughs> yes, I'm going to fight against the enemies of my lord the king. He doesn't say which king it is, but... He wants to go fight against the enemies of his king. Anyway, we don't know what David was planning because the Bible doesn't say. 
I suspect that David is gonna do exactly what they thought he was gonna do, go into battle, and in a strategic moment, his men were gonna turn on the Philistines, maybe even kill the lords of the Philistines, and help Saul get a victory. But we'll never know, because Achish says, you're going back to Ziklag, you're done. So he goes back. I won't read the entire passage, though I'd love to. Uh, you can do that on your own. So David is dismissed. Now, he had been a mercenary for Achish, but now that relationship has in some ways been soured. David's not going into battle with him. That means he's not getting the spoil. And let's just say that if the lords of the Philistines are looking askew at David, probably Achish now is too. The relationship that they had before is gone. David's not going to have all the freedom to go and do all the raids he's been doing because now he is a marked man. And now there's that pressure of him being maybe untrustworthy by some. Achish swears up and down that he trusts David, but that's not shared. So he's kind of, in a way, lost his job. Our job provides stability, it provides purpose, and it helps meet our physical needs. Um, it means that someone desires our work. It means that someone finds us valuable. And on the holmes Rahe scale, losing your job is a 47. Um, which, it, which is quite high of the stress points that you get by losing your job. He also lost his possessions. So now here we are back in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. It says, It came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and, the Z and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. Um, I'll stop there. But the Amalekites came and burned Ziklag and took everything. Now, David had been fighting these roving, marauding bands, and now they attacked him. David had been pretty careful to not let anybody escape, but, I mean, people talk, people know stuff, and maybe, just maybe, word got back to the Amalekites, hey, this isn't the Philistines, this isn't the Midianites, this isn't the Ishmaelites, this is David, and he's living in Ziklag. And the Amalekites go and say, well, we'll take care of this guy. He's gone fighting with the Philistines. Um, he's, he's up north fighting with the Philistines against Israel. This is our chance. So it seems like as soon as they left, the Amalekites came and uh, burned the city. David had lost everything before. He, he, remember, he had a house and a wife. He had to go out the window of his house and never go back. He's been living in caves ever since, and he's been slowly building up this little life with his 600 men there in Ziklag, and now it's all gone again. Our losses um, can be little or a lot, but whether it's a loss of possessions, a loss of health, a loss of status, a loss of um, just anything, that loss means something to us. I know that we're not supposed to be so focused on our stuff. We're supposed to hold all of it very lightly, and yet stuff is still somewhat important to us. We still get a little upset when our car doesn't work, when there's something wrong with our house that we don't know how to fix or we don't know how to do something with, or when we've lost, uh, when our doctor says, hey, uh, the health you've enjoyed so far, that's not the way it's going to be anymore. There's something about that where that, that brings stress to our life because we realize this is the rest of my life sometimes. And that's a very hard thing. It's a 38 on the holmes Rahe scale to lose possessions. He also lost some relationships, um, lost people in his family. Verse 2, when the Amalekites came, they had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, so David didn't find any bodies, which is a relief, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. Um, his, his, his family is gone. Now again, there's no bodies, but... It doesn't really matter, right? It's like, oh, at least they're not dead. They're only kidnapped. Yeah, that's no small relief. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's no great relief to know, oh, they're just captive because maybe they're going to be sold into slavery. Maybe like Joseph, they're going to disappear in Egypt and never be heard from again. Maybe they're going to be uh, abused in some way. 
Maybe they're, at least, at the very least, they're terrified. The Amalekites show up, burn their city, and take them captive. And if you're a man, you're thinking about how terrified your sons, your daughters, your wife is um, at being taken captive and not knowing what's going to happen or where you are. And what's the, men, what's the thing you're thinking in that moment? What's the, every man in the room knows what they're thinking. What is it? I should have been there. I should have been here. I should have been here to protect them. There's stress in that. These men were so moved by this that the Bible says they wept until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever been there where you weep until you literally have no more tears and you have no more energy to cry? I mean, all you can do is, like, you have no energy. I've, I've cried before. I've, I've cried hard before. I don't know that I've ever cried so hard that I didn't have any more energy, and these men are broken. And David is part of this group where he lost his wives. I don't know if he had any children by now. Later on, it'll say some were born to him in Hebron, but at least he, he's lost his relationships. And loss of relationships rank highest on the Holmes Rahe scale. The death of a spouse is 100. A divorce is 73. Separation from your spouse is 65. The death of a family member is 63. And the death of a close friend is 37. Those are stressful things when we lose those relationships. Finally, the fifth thing is what we read in verse 6. And here we are back to our verse. David is greatly distressed, not just because of all this that had happened, but notice the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. David is pressed in because the only people he has left, those 600 men that have fought with him, and you know all the exploits that we're going to learn about later of all these mighty men, all the things they've done together, and now those are the men that are saying, you know who deserves to die for this? David. It's not going to help anything, but they need someone to blame, and the blame rests squarely at David's feet. They spoke of stoning David, their leader. All of those doubts over the last 14 plus months, year and a half, two years, however long it was since they started running, all of those doubts that they kept quiet because it's David and because it seemed like they were winning, all of those came to the surface. I knew this was a bad idea to go to the Philistines. David, what were you thinking? Working for Achish, the king of Gath? What were you thinking? David, I knew this was a bad idea. David, you have not been leading us. You've been leading us in circles. All we want is some stability, and you can't even give us that. David, my son, my daughter is taken captive, and it's your fault. David, wh what have you been doing? You, you promised that you're going to be the king. We're going to have a position in your kingdom. Where is it? You had a chance to kill Saul twice, and you wouldn't do it. You don't care about who we are. You don't care about us being out here in the wilderness. This is your fault, David. And David hears all of that. All of that. Plus everything else we've talked about. He was greatly distressed. That, this is where we find ourselves needing encouragement. This is where we find ourselves. And it, it maybe will never be as bad for you as it was for David in this moment. Maybe it'll be worse. It doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter. Well, I'm more stressed out than you are. It doesn't matter. If it's your stress, it's your stress. Right? That's the thing you have to deal with, and no one else can take that on for you, except maybe our church can help with some of that. Here he is. Lincoln dealt with much in, in his administration. His, just him being elected president caused the congressman to walk out and immediately started talking about forming a new country. In February 1861, he was almost assassinated in Baltimore. He had trouble with his generals where he replaced Scott with McClellan and McClellan with Meade, and he just kept replacing all these generals. In the meantime, the Confederacy had Lee, and they just stuck with him through the end of the war. They had stability, they had knowledgeable generals, and Lincoln really struggled with finding someone who was going to take over. In July of 1861, he lost the battle, the first battle of Bull Run. In August of 1861, he created an income tax for Americans, the first ever income tax in American history to fund help fund this war, which was not very popular with the American people, you can imagine. Um, they were working on some Confederate forts when in February of 1862, his son Willie died of typhoid fever in the White House. It wasn't just very sad for him, it was. 
but it also kind of sent his wife in a tailspin as well. So not only did he have to take care of his family, but he was still just dealing with everything else with the war and just being president of the United States. He was greatly pressed in. Now, what can David do about this situation? The answer is nothing. What is David all by himself supposed to do? He can't ask Samuel. He's dead. He can't ask Saul. Saul hates him. He can't go ask Achish. He's at war with Israel. There's no one else to turn to. David has nothing. But David had said in the past, for instance, in Psalm 27, 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then will the Lord take me up. He had said in Psalm 69, verse 8, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and been an alien unto my mother's children. He, he knew what this felt like and he knew that the Lord had lifted him up. Like Dan read in Psalm 42, why are you cast down, my soul? Hope thou in God. He knew that. It's good to have a network of support, but all the things that you have that are helping you to deal with the stress that you get should all be undergirded by your relationship with God. I'm not saying it's not wise to have savings. I'm not saying it's not wise if you have something wrong to go to the doctor and get some advice. I'm not saying it's wrong to have things that can make your life easier. I'm just saying all of that needs to be undergirded with your relationship with the Lord because those things can go away very easily and very quickly. David's life changed very quickly in a matter of less than a week. So where David turns is exactly where we need to turn, whether we're dealing with the exact same stress or not. Let's look at the act of encouragement. It says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. The word encourage here is the Hebrew word chazak. And I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I have some tools that help me understand some of these things. The word chazak means strength or grasping or seizing or holding. It's the same word used when God tells Moses, pick up the snake, grasp that snake to hold it. It's the same word that is used when Adonijah later on in 1 Kings uh, fleeing for his life, goes into the altar and grabs the horns of the altar for his life. It's the same word. David grabbed on to the Lord. When we say encourage, we think of a Hallmark card or a pat on the back. That's not the word here, right? That's the word. I'm just saying, let's, let's take away our American understanding and say David grabbed onto the Lord like Jacob wrestling with an angel and said, I will not let you go. That's what David was doing here. It's the same word translated, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid in Joshua 1.9. David got by himself and he grabbed onto the Lord. Now this was a good example to his men. It's true, but he needed to. This wasn't to let me show you what to do in the face of stress. He, I imagine, got alone and said, God, I have no one but you. You're the only one who can do anything about this. I'm holding on to you as my only anchor, as my only resource. We don't know. I wish, I wish, I wish there was a psalm that said, written when uh, David, you know, was take, when David's family was taken in Ziklag and the city was burnt with fire, and we could read one of those psalms. That would be one of the ones I'd love to have. We don't have that. So I have, we can only guess what was this. I think, first of all, it was a position of repentance. It was acknowledging his own weakness. David had put himself in this situation by helping, Israel, by helping Israel's enemies. For 14 months, he'd been helping the Philistines. Achish is able to go to war because he has a war chest provided by David. That was a mistake. We talked about this last week. That was a detour that he should not have taken. And he comes to God and he admits, I was going on my own, in my own weakness. Now Saul hasn't learned this lesson. Saul is also distressed. He sees the Philistines. Where does he go? Do you remember? He goes to seek out a familiar spirit, a woman who can speak to demons. That's where he goes, and that's how he encourages himself. That's where he grabs onto. What a difference. What a contrast between David and Saul. 
What David said was something like the thing that we need to say, say, Lord, I have acted with no reverence to you at all. I, I've been going in my own way with nary a thought of what you might want. I have pretended that you have no say in my life and I have gone my own way. I have leaned on my own understanding and God, I come to you now and say, I shouldn't have, it was wrong and I'm sorry. God, you're worthy of my turning my face to you. You're worthy of me asking for direction and wisdom because you have proved yourself faithful over and over and over and over again. It's a position of repentance. It's a position of remembrance. What did David have? The only thing David had physically were the promises of God. That's the only thing he had in that moment. God had promised that David would reign and that God would protect him. David himself had said in Psalm 31, verses 23 and 24, Oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage. That's the same word, chazak, be encouraged. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. David knew that. And he said, God, you have proven yourself faithful. You have promised to be my rock and my shield and my fortress and my high place, my protector, my defender. You have promised to do all those things. And God, for a moment, I didn't believe you, but I have that now. Well, how is he going to strengthen? What is he going to grab onto? We say grab onto the Lord, hold on to the Lord. Hold on to what? Hold on to his promises. That means you have to know them. It means you have to understand them. It means you have to claim them. See, I think part of the reason that we don't live in the promises of God by faith is we don't know them. We're not getting to know the Lord and his promises. But the other thing I think is we just don't believe them. We just don't really think that God cares that much about us, whether it's a self-esteem issue or whether we just don't believe that God is that faithful. The problem is always, always us and never what God is offering us. God offers us all the resources of heaven, all of his mercies, all of his strength, all of his grace and power. It's all available for us. He has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The Bible says that, and we just don't take of it. So for us, it's a position of remembrance. In this moment, he was reminded of all the times that God helped. And if you don't have those for yourself, those times that you knew God was there, he was the one constant, if you don't have that, then get that from Scripture, from your time with the Lord, and even from other Christians. To say, hey, can you? And this is where, as a church, we can help others. Someone who's distressed and pressed in, we can come alongside and say, hey, listen, this happened to me, and I rested on the Lord. I leaned on him, and he came through for me in a big way. That's part of what it means to be a part of a church, that we're not just supposed to be living our individual lives, but that when we see the faithfulness of God, we're supposed to remind others of the faithfulness of God in our lives so that they can actually put, because it's one thing to say, oh yeah, God helped David. But don't, isn't it true? We always kind of think of David as like, well, maybe less after this series, as this like high person, right? He had his ups and downs, but we think of the people in the Bible as like, well, those are spiritual giants. And then you have somebody who's just like you in your church come alongside you and say, yeah, man, I struggle with this too, and God met me here. And uh, that helps remind you. It's a position of remembrance. It's also a position of seeking after God. Here in chapter 30, verse 7, David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he, the Lord, answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. This is the first time that David's gone to the Lord since 1 Samuel 23. David has been going on his own, and now in that moment where he encourages himself to the Lord, as he's clinging to the Lord, he says, I've got to know the mind of God. And so he says, Ahitab, bring over the Urim and the Thummim. You know, do whatever it is. But I want to inquire of the Lord. I need to know what God wants for me. And so he goes to the Lord and God gives him direction. God reiterates his promise. They will recover all. You can count on it. We think we are bothering God by asking him. But he calls us to seek after him. He says in Psalm 27, verse 8, When thou sayest, Seek my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. 
In Isaiah 55, verse 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. God invites us to seek after him. It's not like, well, there's the tier of Christian that just kind of goes about the Christian life, and then there's the seeking God Christian. Now, if you want to get to that level, here's what you've got to do before you can level up, you know, before you can upgrade to this level. No, this, this is the standard Christian life that every single Christian is supposed to be seeking after God. God, what do you want? God, I'm, I'm listening. I want you to make it very clear what you want, and I want anything that's my will to be gone and anything that's your will to be forefront. I want what you want, and God, I'm willing to listen. David now gets to that point. I don't know what his life would have been like if he'd started with this, if it had always been, let's follow, let's follow the Lord, let's inquire of the Lord. But at least in this moment, and I'm so thankful that God doesn't say, well, you've messed up too much. I don't know what you're going to do, David. Oh, now you come searching for me, huh? Oh, now you come and ask me what you want. Oh, where were you 14 months ago? You notice that God doesn't do a bit of that. David comes and says, what am I supposed to do? And God says, I'm so glad you asked. Go after them. You'll overtake them. They haven't gotten too far. And you're going to recover everything. And he did. He not only recovered everything, but he got more. I'm not saying that's the way it's going to be for you. I'm just saying that God knows what he's doing. And if you'll commit to following the Lord, saying, God, that wasn't right. What am I doing? Going my own way? God, I'm committing to seeking after your face. God is not saying, ah, fine, follow me. He is saying, I was waiting for you. I, I wish I could tell you all the things I wanted to do for you had you been here, but here you are right now. Let's go. Let's do this. And that's what happens. Lincoln found himself leaning on the Lord more as he went. And again, I don't believe necessarily, at, the, at least at the beginning, that he was a born-again believer. But he did say this, and he saw it firsthand. You can't lead a country through a civil war and not see God's hand in it. He said this, I go to assume a task more difficult than that which was developed upon Washington. Unless the great God who assisted him shall be with me and aid me, I must fail. But if the same omniscient mind and almighty arm that directed and protected him shall guide and support me, I shall not fail, I shall succeed. Lincoln said, I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for that day. Listen, Lincoln, who was not a born-again believer, didn't, wasn't a part of any church, said that I cannot face the day without going on my knees. And we as Christians say, yeah, I think I can probably, I'll probably be fine. I don't need to pray this morning. I don't need to spend that much time in prayer. You say, well, I'm not leading... Um, people through the Civil War. No, but you're also a believer. You also have the Holy Spirit. You also have lots of needs in your life. And maybe they're not as drastic, but they're still important. Yeah. Right? We usually encourage ourselves with lies. We strengthen ourselves with lies, which is like grabbing onto clouds and hoping that they'll hold us up. We say, it'll probably be fine, or I can figure this out on my own. But I want to encourage you to do the hard work of seeking after God and being okay with his plan. Finally, let's look at the results of the encouragement. And I don't have time to go through the whole story. So verse 9, David went, he and 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. Uh, verse 10, David pursued. Let's skip down to verse 16. When he had brought him down, he, so he finds this Egyptian slave who agrees to take him down to the Amalekite camp. Verse 16, when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And uh, David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them save 400 young men, which rode upon uh, camels and fled. Now, <laughs> that's always an interesting thing. You know, they didn't have anybody escape except 400 men. Well, that tells me that this is a pretty big army. This is pretty big. They had four, they, David and his men were 400, and they fight this. So they said they killed almost everybody except 400. That must mean that was a pretty big army. And David goes in. There must have been a lot of spoil here. David goes in, and he and his men, and they smite them. And verse 18, and David recovered all. 
that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, this is David's spoil. David was restored. And in verse 26, he sent presents to those in Judah to restore what had been lost to them. Hey, I heard you lost something. I heard that the Amalekites came and took something from you, but I got it back. Here's yours, plus a little bit more that they took from the Philistines. What is David doing? Well, David's solidifying himself as the next king of Israel. Maybe he doesn't know that because he doesn't know that Saul's about to die. We do, and so we look at that. But David at least is saying, God has delivered me. God has given me everything that I need, and God's restored to me what I lost, and so I'm going to share that with you. We need to be strengthened. We need to be strengthened. We need to be encouraged, but it has to be in the right way. Zechariah 4, verse 6. We don't spend a lot of time in Zechariah, but Zechariah 4, 6 says this, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So I think it's good to be prudent. I think it's good to have as much strength as we can. Just understand that all of that needs to be undergirded by our reliance on God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong. And most sports people would just stop there. Be strong. But it says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Ephesians 6 is that whole, put on the whole armor of God. Yeah, there's a battle to fight. No, you're not supposed to fight it on your own. Yeah, there's a, there's a deadly enemy. Yes, also, there's armor for you. It's not a Christianized version of self-help, but waiting on him. I may sound like a broken record. And for those of you who don't know what a record is, <laughs> I may sound like someone who's repeating themselves over and over, just an echo every week. I know what Pastor Han's going to say. Cultivate a relationship with God so that you can learn how to depend on him. Yep. And that's the only message I have. It's the only sermon I have. I, will, I have one note on my banjo, and I will pluck it and pluck it and pluck it until I die. That's it. Because that is what's really going to help you. I could give you a list of things. Do these things as a Christian and you'll flourish. And, and that would honestly be pretty easy. But, or I could say, hey, this week, learn to cultivate your relationship with God. Ask yourself this week and be honest, how much am I depending on my own self, my stuff? And what would happen if those things were taken away? Ask yourself even this question. If everything was taken away, how angry would I be with God? That's a pretty good indicator of where your own heart is and how much you're relying on those things. I don't know where the Lord is going to meet you in this, but let's take the example of David, that when he was greatly distressed, he encouraged himself in the Lord. He grabbed on to where God was until God met him. 